What is a hero? A hero is more than just someone who saves lives. It's someone who is kind and cares for others. There are so many unmasked heroes across the DMV that pour into the community and ask for nothing in return. We wanted to take a chance to highlight those heroes and their contributions. I'm Samantha Gilstrap, this is DMV Heroes, and these are their stories. We begin here in DC's bustling neighborhood of Columbia Heights. Nestled on 11th Street is Bloom Bars, a colorful two-story building entirely dedicated to supporting local artists and art lovers alike. It's a performance space, art gallery, market, and so much more all under the same roof. But despite its name, don't expect to find any alcohol at this bar. Founder of Bloom Bars and this month's DMV hero is John Chambers. So I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts, the only boy. My parents were educators slash civil rights activists from the 50s all the way to the end of my father's life. And my mother's still on her 21st year of her uh, anti-racism film festival that she started in Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts. So family of uh, activists, writers, uh, creatives. Growing up being pretty much the only you know, person of color, black person in, in, in my grades growing up. There was an incident, well, there was many incidents, but there was a tipping point where it was like, I can't stay here. I gotta get out before I graduate. So I went to a boarding school for a year in New Hope, Pennsylvania, which was a life-changing experience. It was amazing. I went from not super applying myself because I didn't really believe in the curriculum to really immersing myself in, in all manner of subjects. And came that time to look for colleges and my friends uh, at the school I was going to, sister was at Howard and it was homecoming. Howard was gonna be it and I really wanted the next academic experience to really immerse myself in, you know, in black culture. My sophomore year, I had an internship um, with a small communications firm. They had just started their own firm and they had some radio equipment that was donated to them. So my boss looked at me and said, hey, you wanna do something with this radio equipment? I, and I said, sure, let's figure something out. And uh, we built a radio network. So yeah, I, I got a jump start, you know, working with civil rights leaders, with other activists, with corporate leaders, um, just exposed me to a range of, uh, of different things early. So I could say I got a really good jump. And then right after that, I went to work in the Clinton administration on the census, census 2000. And then I went to an, a communications firm in Georgetown that was global and worked on big public health issues, causes from around the world. But you know, after about eight years, I felt a little removed um, from the you know touching and feeling the impact. It was macro, and I was sort of craving micro. This was also around the time of the 2008 election, so we were part of that, and that inspired, really inspired me to think about what I could do differently um, through the arts and through, you know, all the creatives that I had surrounded myself around, which for some reason didn't really resonate with um, the campaigns um, that I was working on that I thought, you know, this could really be if we bring them, you know, these artists, I mean, this, this is how it happened in the 60s with my parents, you know, like artists were a part of the movement from they were at the table talking strategy. It wasn't just like a press conference or let me do this. Um, so that's when I really started to think about um, leaning more into the arts as a way to affect change. How did Bloom Bars come to be? How did that idea begin? Well, a lot of positive forces and ancestors and things just came together at the right time. I live around the corner. Um, this is my community where better to make an impact than where you live. And I was inspired by um, someone who's like a brother to me. His name's Shane Evans, creative, children's book illustrator, author, musician, just multi-hyphenate. He had opened a studio in Kansas City and I flew down there and helped him build it. And, and that was really inspiring. And I was touring the country at the time with some artists um, trying to get voter registration out. So the bigger idea was Bloom Bars, you know, plural everywhere, you know, like this could happen everywhere, but it can be right for that community. It can really be indigenous to that community and not like some, you know, Starbucks that is branded, but really serves the needs of the, of the community. So this was the 
supposed to be the pilot, turned into the mothership. We've branched out. Yeah, that's how this particular building came to be. I mortgaged my life and my retirement and a lot of other sacrifices to get it. And it started out with monthly events, interdisciplinary events, visual arts, concerts, and grew and I had my daughter and realized there wasn't a lot of programming for young people. And then our kids program started and then it just, it grew from there. We've had some really special people come through who have either were already established you know, well-known, you would know the name, not a name dropper, <laughs> um, but you would know. And those that sort of started here and we really nurtured their growth and they've gone on to win Grammy Awards and other big awards. But yeah, that's that's kind of how, how it started. I was on the, you know, big communications firm and an, uh, an executive to this was uh, you know, it was a metamorphosis. It was a shedding of, of ego. It was a shedding of just how I, how I think change um, can happen. And it's not something that has stayed static. It, it changes over time and it's hard. People don't see what happens behind the scenes and what it takes to actually keep these doors open. But the people that have come through here and have been a part of this experience are just some of the most beautiful, amazing people that you'll ever encounter. And they may never be famous and you may never hear them. Um, and that's okay too, because they believed in what they did and are doing and it's still having that same impact, even if it's not, you know, they're not TikTok famous. They really put their heart into being true to themselves. It's interesting if you just sit outside and listen to people describe or wonder what this is and their friend explains to them, there's a different answer every time. It's nice when people make it what they make it from their own experience, right? So you're not imposing, oh, it's a children's programs and music programs. Oh, it's an open mic space. Oh, it's a film screening place. So oh, it's, a, you know, there's all, it's an art gallery. It's. It is those things to them, right? And they have a sense of ownership because they've experienced that when they walk in the door, like, oh, I, you know, and I can create this. So how things happen here and how things are created is, is people really coming with that intention and us working together. So it's, it's an understanding that it's not just a venue that they're gonna come in and use. It's, we're gonna collaborate, we're gonna curate. I mentor a lot of artists. I, you know, I'm a creative myself, so it's a collaboration. And I think that's the important principle in holding space is that you need to decenter yourself, but also ch you know, check your ego, but also make sure that everybody in that circle um, has that same understanding. And when that happens, that's when really magical things happen. What do you think the significance of having that safe space to express yourself creatively is? I don't think you can put a price on it. Um, I just, I hear from others, you know, people have met their partner and husband or wife. People have found their bandmates here. People come here to cry. You know, some people say, this is my church. It, yeah. You know, the, the house rules are kind of loose now in our 16th year. It's kind of like, you know, the last child gets to get away with everything. You know, the younger generation, we really want them here and to be able to express themselves freely. And at the same time, we're living in a really, um, there's no words to, to, to put to this time that we're living in. <laughs> It's profane in a lot of ways. So I, I wouldn't say there's no profanity uh, as we once did. We have, still have a cursed jar, you know, feel free to put that. Cause that rule, you know, just in terms of really thinking about what we're saying um, is putting a vibration out there. It's also putting an intention. And if this is an all ages space, we want children to feel comfortable here. We want people who are sober or people who, you know, want to bring their grandmother. And even if a young person or a grandmother or somebody isn't here, there's somebody here who's saying, oh, I can't bring my grandmother here if it's really inappropriate, you know? So that's why we try to keep it PG-13 and keep it family friendly. That's very important to us. Every Saturday, you know, you have people who uh, are reading for the first time. You have people who have really gone through a lot of trauma. And this is sort of the culmination of their healing is to be able to share that from the stage. You have people who have done eulogies. You know, there was a great story many years ago. So there was a, uh, a young man who was um, 
a little bit of a leader of a, a, a little crew, you know, he was, you know, interesting, interesting guy approached me and asked me if I like poetry. I, that kind of shocked me. Yeah, yeah, I like poetry. We do poetry here. You should come to the open mic. No, well, listen, I had an idea. He said, I said, okay, what's your idea? I said, I like poetry. I want to do poetry in the morning. I was like, whoa, before school. Whoa, okay. Before we could even have our next conversation, I'm getting coffee at our old coffee shop down the street and I see this little barista looking confused. I look over and I come up and he says, yeah, we're doing this poetry in the morning thing and I'd like you guys to sponsor us and give free coffee for the event. He was already on it. I'm talking, he's like 12 at the time. This is like, a, you know, maybe younger than that, young kid. And we did that poetry in the morning for two years. It got written up. We conferenced in with other countries because the time zone difference. We could like, you know, have a poetry in the morning with Nepal. Um, and it was beautiful. It's, it's a nurturing space. It's welcoming. There's no need to be afraid. And I think people get that when they get in. It doesn't necessarily need to be spoken um, because kids, I mean, they've grown up here from when they were infants, even in the womb, mothers bring their kids when they're in their late in their pregnancy because they can hear those sound waves, right? You know, I, I just I, I just honor 16 years. Um, I'm sitting here in this chair, but there's been so many people who have been um, integral into growing this space, whether it's through programming, whether it's coming in and helping sweep or, you know, donating instruments. There's so many ways that people have kept this, this idea, this experiment uh, in generosity, this experiment in building community um, in ways that I can't, I can't even express. The arts, is a, it's a lifelong thing. It's like, like lifelong learning. You're constantly creating. It's, it's, it's enhancing your life in so many ways. Whether you choose to be a mathematician, an engineer, a scientist, the arts can always be a part of your life. Uh, or it can be the center of your life if you believe in that. It's really a question of answering the hard questions without words that we can't find. I think that's one of the things that art does is helps us express the things that we can't speak. So yeah, I, I, I encourage them to come here or learn an instrument or there's so many opportunities, especially in this city, to, um, to get out there and be creative and explore your own creativity. Yeah, you bloom, we bloom. Yeah. <laughs>